pleasant day to everyone. Thank you for watching this presentation on Philippine sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea. If you look at the screen, you will see the South China Sea. Why is the South China Sea important? Today, the South China Sea is one of the most important international waterways in the world. About 5.3 trillion U.S. dollars in shipborne goods traverse the South China Sea every year. Four leading exporting countries use the South China Sea for their maritime trade. You have China, you have uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. About 65% of the petroleum imports of South Korea, 60% of the petroleum imports of uh, Japan and Taiwan pass through the narrow strait of Malacca on the way to these countries. And today, 50% of the petroleum imports of China pass through the narrow strait of Malacca going to China. But before 2015, 80% of the petroleum imports of China passed through the narrow strait of Malacca. And China was always worried that someone might block this narrow strait and the Chinese economy will grind to a halt. So China built two pipelines, one for oil, another for gas, from the coast of Myanmar to Kunin in Yunnan province. And these pipelines started operating in 2015. So today, 30% of the petroleum imports of China pass through these two pipelines and only 50% pass through the narrow strait of Malacca. About 12% of the total annual fish catch of the world uh, comes from the South China Sea. The South China Sea is very rich in fishery. It's a very small sea. It, com it comprises only about 2.5% of the ocean surface of the world, but it accounts for 12% of the annual fish catch because of the spratlies. The spratlies are an extensive collection of atoll, atoll reefs, and the spratlies are where the fish spawn. They lay their eggs there. And uh, the eggs and larvae of the fish that spawn here are carried by currents to the coast of China, Vietnam, Luzon, Palawan, Sulu Sea, the coast of uh, Indonesia here in the Natunas, coast of uh, uh, Borneo, Vietnam. And that's why we have a lot of fish in the South China Sea. If you remove the spratlies, you will not get as much fish as you have now in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is also rich in methane hydrates. What are methane hydrates? They are lumps of minerals found in the bottom of the sea. In the bottom of the sea where the temperature is very cold and the pressure is very strong, ice crystals form around natural gas. So natural gas is encapsulated in ice crystals and there's now a technology to extract this natural gas. Methane hydrates uh, are estimated to uh, be more abundant than uh, oil and gas combined. The world reserves of methane hydrates are more than the combined reserves of oil and gas in the world. And China has es estimated that the methane hydrates in the South China Sea could power the Chinese economy for a hundred years at least. So China now is testing here in the coast of Guangdong a uh, pilot area where they are extracting methane hydrates. Uh, China has the technology to extract natural gas from methane hydrates. Uh, U.S. has that technology and Canada has that technology and Japan also has that technology. So the South China Sea uh, is now a very important international waterway. Of the 5.3 trillion uh, uh, shipborne goods that pass through the South China Sea every year, about a trillion of that is U.S. inbound and outbound trade, and another trillion is uh, European Union inbound and outbound trade. So these countries outside of the region have an interest in maintaining peace and stability in the South China Sea because their exports and imports pass through the South China Sea. And the South China Sea is also dotted with hundreds of small rocks above water at high tide. If the rock is only an inch above water at high tide, it's considered still land 
or territory entitled to a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles all around. What is the surface area of that? That's about 155,000 hectares. How large is 155,000 hectares? That's more than twice the land area of Metro Manila, more than twice the land area of Singapore. So if you own a tiny rock, one inch above water at high tide in the South China Sea, you own everything within the territorial sea. You own all the fish, oil, gas, and mineral resources. So a tiny rock in the middle of the South China Sea is very valuable. So that countries now fight over these small rocks. And that's why we have the South China Sea dispute. Because those rocks are very valuable. Even if you cannot grow a single tree in that rock, it still has a 12 nautical mile territorial sea around that. And that's a huge area. And also, even if the rock is submerged at high tide, it has still a value. In the proceedings at The Hague, we showed the tribunal Pagasa, that's our largest island in the Spratlys, and we told the tribunal that Pagasa being above water at high tide, it's about 45 hectares in area, it has a territorial sea around it, 12 nautical miles, but in this area, there is a low tide rock here, and under UNCLOS, a low tide rock can be used to measure the 12 nautical mile. So if you measure the 12 nautical mile from this rock, then we have an extended here. Our territorial sea is more than 12 nautical miles from the coastline of Pagasa because we're measuring it from this rock that is low tide. That rock is not land, it is not territory because it's submerged at high tide, but you can see it at low tide. That's why it's called a low tide rock it still has a value because it can extend your territorial sea. And the tribunal upheld us. And that's why the tribunal said, Subi Reef is part of the territorial sea of Pagasa because if you measure the 12 nautical mile territorial sea from this rock, Subi Reef is part of the territorial sea. If it's measured from the coastline here of Pagasa, Subi Reef is outside our territorial sea. But UNCLOS allows that under Article 13, Paragraph 1, we can use this as our baseline, the low tide rock. Now, China did not participate in the proceedings of The Hague, but China submitted a position paper. China said, we're not participating, but this is our position. And this is in that position paper. China said, we own the South China Sea because we owned it since 2,000 years ago. We were the first country to discover, name, explore, and exploit the resources of the South Sea Island. This is the historical narrative of China, why they are claiming the South China Sea as theirs. And this historical narrative has been taught to every Chinese citizen from grade school to college. So every Chinese general, admiral, Politburo member, diplomat, professor, businessman, bureaucrat, they have been taught this historical narrative and they sincerely believe it. They sincerely believed that they owned the South China Sea since 2,000 years ago. They were the first to discover, name and explore and exploit. This historical narrative is totally false. I call this the fake news of the millennium, the fake history of the millennium. It's totally false, and we will, I will prove it here. Now, in 2009, China submitted this map to the United Nations. This is called the nine dash line map of China. And uh, the note verbal that accompanied this map, China said, we own everything within the nine dash line. And the tri tribunal at The Hague said, it is only from this date that the world was notified of China's claim. Although the nine dash line map was made by China in 1947, it was only uh, distributed within China and it did not bind the world. From 2009 when this was submitted to the UN, that was the time when countries should object and we objected to this map. We protested China does not own the waters within the Nine Dash Line. And Indonesia prote protested, Vietnam protested, so many countries protested. Now, in 2013, China published a new map. This is called the vertical map because the orientation is vertical. 
And in this map, China added the 10th dash on the eastern side of Taiwan. So the nine dash lines are still growing up to today. Uh, there are 10 dashes now, but I still call it the nine dash line. And in this map, if you look at the legend of the map, this shading, which means national boundary, is the shading you find in the 10 dashes, the same shading on the continental land boundary of China. So China treats the waters within the 10 dashes here in the same way it treats its territory here, its land territory. China treats the waters as its national territory. And we protested also this map. Now, let's go back to a little bit of history. What happened in the South China Sea from 1946 to 2017? Before World War II, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. Not a single Chinese sailor or soldier was stationed in the South China Sea, none in the Paracels, none in the Spratlys, none in Scarborough Shoal. So throughout the Chinese dynasties, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. China never occupied any of the territory islands in the South China Sea. Now, when did China move out of the Hainan? Before World War II, just before World War II, uh, the Japanese seized the parcels from the French. The French occupied the parcels at the time. And Japan also occupied Ituaba, the largest island in the Spratlys, and Japan put up a submarine base in Ituaba. That submarine base was used in the invasion of the Philippines. With the defeat of the Japanese forces, so the Japanese forces left the South China Sea, China made its move. In 1946, after the World War II, when the Japanese forces left the South China Sea, China ceased half of the parcels. The other half of the parcels was recovered by the French and inherited by the South Vietnamese government. And also in 1946, China seized Ituaba, that submarine base of the Japanese. So China made a great leap in 1946 from uh, Hainan to the Paracels and to the Spratlys. In 1974, towards the dying days of the Vietnam War, China seized the other half of the Paracels from the South Vietnamese government, which was very weak at the time already. There was a battle there, the Battle of the Paracels. In 1987, China put up a radar weather station on Fiery Cross Reef. In 1987, uh, UNESCO was conducting a, a global oceanic survey and China volunteered. China said, we will help UNESCO. We will put up a radar weather station on Fiery Cross Reef to help UNESCO. And it was a very noble act. Nobody objected. Everybody applauded China. Today, Fiery Cross Reef is an air and naval base of China. In 1988, China seized Subi Reef from the Philippines. We did not even notice it. It was not reported in the newspapers in Manila. We were not familiar then with the UNCLOS, but China seized uh, Subi Reef. And at the same time, China seized Johnson South Reef from the uh, Vietnamese, from the communist Vietnamese, and there was a skirmish in the Johnson South Reef between the uh, Vietnamese and the uh, Chinese, and about 69 Vietnamese sailors were killed in that skirmish. 1995, China seized Mischief Free from the Philippines that was widely, report, widely reported in the papers in Manila. 2012, China seized Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines, widely reported also. And uh, 2013, China seized Lukunya Shoals from Malaysia. Lukunya Shoals is just 54 nautical miles from the coast of uh, Sabah. 2015, 2016, China started building air and naval bases on its seven geologic features in the Spratlys. China started reclaiming those uh, geologic features, uh, creating artificial islands. 2017, China seized Sandy Cay from the Philippines. China seized it by surrounding Sandy Cay with, it, by, uh, with its 
maritime militia vessels the same way that it seized Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines. China surrounded it with their vessels, their Coast Guard vessels and their maritime vessels. And that's how they seized Sandy Cay uh, from the Philippines. Sandy Cay is just two nautical miles from Pagasa, our largest island in the Spratlys. But the Duterte administration is still in denial. The Duterte administration does not, ac does not uh, accept that uh, or does not tell the Filipino people uh, that we have lost Sandy Cay to the Chinese. So, if you look at this uh, developments from 1946 to 2017, you will see a creeping expansion by China in the South China Sea. And that is exactly what happened from 1946 to 2017. In February 2016, a few months before uh, the tribunal issued its ruling in July 2016, the Chinese foreign minister, Minister Wang Yi, gave a talk in uh, Washington, D.C. at the CSIS, that's the leading think tank in Washington, D.C., and before diplomats from all over the world, Foreign Minister Wang Yi said, China and the Philippines are very close neighbors, separated by just a narrow body of water. China and the Philippines are very close neighbors, separated by a narrow body of water. Think of that. How can we be very close neighbors, separated by just a narrow body of water? This is it. Since the Nine Dust Line constitutes nati the national boundary of China, China owns all of the waters to the west, and we are left with uh, this sliver of water as our territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. So from Balabak Island, our southernmost island facing the South China Sea, Chinese territory is just 64 kilometers away. From Bulinao in the Pangasinan, Chinese territory is just 70 kilometers away. From Yami Island, our southernmost territory in the Batanes, Chinese territory boundary, China's boundary is just 44 kilometers away. This is the historical narrative that has been taught to every Chinese citizen. So when uh, President Xi Jinping came here last November 2018, before his actual arrival, the ambassador of China, Ambassador Zhao, wrote an opinion piece in Philippine Star. He wrote it, uh, it appeared in November 15, 2018. And uh, in that opinion piece, his opening sentence said, stated that being separated by only a narrow strip of water, China and the Philippines have been close neighbors for centuries. So this is the historical narrative again. This, according to Ambassador Zhao, is the context of the visit of President Xi Jinping to Manila. Since the Philippines and China are very close neighbors, President Zhao is visiting the Philippines, and this was officially published in uh, Philippine Star, and I asked the star editors who provided this picture, and the editor said, Ambassador Zhao. So the subtle message of the Chinese is that President Duterte and the entire cabinet agree that the Philippines and China have been very close neighbors for centuries, separated by only a narrow strip of water. The Duterte administration never contested this, never objected to this. So, um, but the, uh, President Z finally arrived in Manila, and he, when he arrived, he published an opinion piece, front, uh, full page in uh, Manila Bulletin and Philippine Star, and in that full page ad was entitled "Open Up New Future Together for Philippines China Philippines Relations," and in his, in his opinion piece, President Z said. Over 600 years ago, Chinese navigator Zheng He made multiple visits to Manila, Visaya, Sulu on his seven overseas voyages. So, President Xi was telling everybody in the Philippines that the Chinese were here 
in Manila over 600 years ago. Why did President Z say this? Because last year, 2019, the Spaniards celebrated the 500-year departure of Magellan from Spain to the Philippines. Magellan left Spain in 1519. And two and a half years later, he arrived in the Philippines in 1521. So next year, 2021, we will be celebrating the 500-year anniversary of uh, Magellan and the arrival of Christianity. But President Z is saying, no, we were ahead. We were in the Philippines 600 years ago. The, the Spaniards arrived 500 years ago only. So President Z is saying, we were ahead of the Spaniards by over 100 years. So... The Chinese are saying we were the first to discover the Philippines. And the consequence of that is since we were the first to discover the, the islands in the Philippines belong to us. But they will say we are generous. We will not recover Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. But we will keep the Spratly and Scarborough Shoal. That is the message of President Z. But this narrative is totally false. Zheng He never visited the Philippines. That's uh, the article of uh, President Z in uh, Philippine Star. That's in Manila Bulletin. Now, there is an international Zheng He Society, and they have a branch in Singapore. These are composed of scholars. And in 2005, the Singapore Zheng He International Society published a book. Admiral Zheng He and Southeast Asia. And one of the articles in that book was written by Professor Xu. And his title of his uh, article is, Did Admiral Zheng He Visit the Philippines? Professor Xu said, Zheng He never visited the Philippines. The word Chan Cheng was actually a Ming Dynasty name for a Malay state in Indochina. They thought that Chan Cheng refers to Luzon. But Professor Xu said Chan Cheng is a Ming Dynasty name for a Malay state in Indochina. Was there a Malay state, state in Indochina? Yes, the Cham Kingdom. The Chams were descended from the Austronesians. We Filipinos are descended from the Austronesians. We speak a language, Tagalog, is derived from the Austronesian language, and the language of the Chams was also derived from the Austronesian language. And uh, the Chams put up a powerful maritime kingdom in central Vietnam. This was uh, before the arrival of uh, the Europeans uh, in the South China Sea. So this was before uh, the 1400s, before the 14th century. Uh, the Chams uh, were so powerful that the South China Sea was called the Cham Sea. The first name ever given to the South China Sea was the Cham Sea because the Chams were a maritime, a powerful maritime kingdom in central Vietnam facing the Cham Sea. Last December, I visited the, uh, Da Nang in central Vietnam, and there is in Da Nang a Cham Museum. <clears throat> and one of the books sold there is this book. And uh, the book says that the name Chan Zheng comes from the term Champapura, that means the, the town of Champa. And uh, the inhabitants of the Champa kingdom were Chams. And they were, the Cham language fell under the Austronesian umbrella. These, the Chams were our, dis, our, were our distant cousins because they were Austronesians just like us. So, Zheng He actually visited uh, central Vietnam, and, and Chan Cheng is, is in central Vietnam, not in the Philippines. Now, there is a, a Chinese scholar. He works in the People's Republic of China, the Naval Hydrographic Institute. He wrote an article in the International Hydrographic Review in 1988, and he he traced the route of the voyages of Zheng He from, uh, from China to central Vietnam all the way to the Strait of Malacca. Here is the Philippines. So Zheng He never even saw the coastlines of the Philippines. 
And this is from a Chinese scholar who works in the People's Republic of China. Now, in 2018, uh, National Geographic uh, magazine published an article on the seven voyages of Zheng He. And that article contained a chart of the voyage of Zheng He, the nautical uh, route of Zheng He, and it follows the same route. From China, he went to central Vietnam, through the narrow strait of Malacca. The Philippines is here. So Zheng He never visited the Philippines. In fact, all the scholars all over the world are unanimous. Zheng He never visited the Philippines. Now, the largest island in the Spratlys uh, is Ituaba. That's a picture of the Spratlys. It's about uh, 45 hectares uh, compared to Pagasa. Pagasa, by the way, is 36 hectares only. So this is occupied now by Taiwan. The issue in the arbitration is, is this island capable of human habitation of its own? Because if it's capable of human habitation of its own, it is entitled to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea plus an extended continental shelf up to 200 nautical miles. Now, if this island is not capable of human habitation of its own, then none of the islands in the Spratlys would also be capable of human habitation of its own, and therefore all islands in Spratlys will be entitled only to 12 nautical mile territorial sea. China has declared that Ituaba is capable of generating 200 nautical mile EEZ. So that, that EEZ will overlap with the EEZ of Palawan, and there will be an overlapping EEZ, and therefore since China made a reservation in uh, 2006 uh, that in case of overlapping EEZs, China will not be subjected, will not submit itself to compulsory arbitration. And therefore, since this island has an EEZ, the tribunal at the Hague has no jurisdiction over the case. So the issue of whether Ituaba is capable of human habitation of its own or not was crucial in the case because if it was capable of human habitation, then its EEZ of 200 nautical miles would overlap with the EEZ of Palawan and therefore the tribunal has no jurisdiction because this island is uh, just over 200 nautical miles from Palawan. Now what is the ruling of, what was the ruling of the tribunal? The tribunal said to determine whether an island is capable of human habitation or not, you must look at its natural condition, whether it can sustain a stable community of people. And in Ituaba, people can live there because Taiwan has put up two desalination plants. People can gather as a uh, there are vegetable gardens there, there are fruit trees there because Taiwan imported garden soil from Taipei and placed it uh, in Ituaba. So you can plant fruit trees there now in Ituaba. But the tribunal said that will not count because you must look at the natural condition. And the tribunal said in its natural condition, it's a borderline case whether Ituaba can support a stable community of people. There is water when there, there is rain, but when there is no rain, you don't find water in Ituaba. The topsoil is very thin, so it's a borderline case. And in, case of a, in, in, in that case, if it's a borderline case, you must look at the historical presence of people in Ituaba. Did people actually inhabit Ituaba in the past. There is no record whatsoever, none. So the tribunal said, since there has been no record of human habitation in Ituaba, then it's probably because Ituaba is not capable of human habitation of its own. So the ruling was Ituaba, the largest island in the Spratlys, is not capable of human habitation of its own, and therefore it has no EEZ, it has only a territorial sea.
And that was the reason why the tribunal said we have jurisdiction because there is no overlapping EEZA between Palawan and any of the features in the Spratlys. Okay, let's go to Scarborough Shoal. That's Scarborough Shoal, just uh, a piece of rock that's at uh, high tide. That's the only thing you can see. So it's a high tide elevation. It's above water high tide, so it's land, it's territory. China says it's capable of human habitation of its own and it's entitled to 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And we said, of course not, it's so obvious it's not capable of human habitation. Not a single blade of grass grows there. You cannot squeeze a single drop of fresh water. And so the tribunal agreed with us that Scarborough Shoal is just a rock. It's entitled to 12 nautical mile territorial sea, but that's all. It cannot generate an exclusive economic zone. The, the tribunal, of course, said that uh, under UNCLOS, a coastal state can claim 12 nautical miles territorial sea, and if there's space, an additional 188 nautical miles or a total of 200 nautical miles from the coastline, and if there's still space, another 150 nautical miles. So the maximum that a state can claim under UNCLOS is 350 nautical miles. China is claiming more than 350 nautical miles. China is claiming Reed Bank, which is about 800 nautical miles from Hainan. So the claim of China to waters within the Nine Dash Line beyond 350 nautical miles has no legal basis. That's the ruling of the tribunal. Every state in the world, every coastal state can claim only up to 350 nautical miles, 12 nautical miles territorial sea, 200 nautical miles easy measured from the coastline and additional 150 nautical miles measured from the edge of the EEZ. That's all. You cannot claim beyond that because that's UNCLOS, that's the law of the sea. And so we were very confident that the tribunal would uphold us in, in our position that the nine dash line has no legal basis at all to claim waters beyond uh, what is allowed under UNCLOS. But our problem was, we knew that the problem would be how to enforce the ruling. Because the Chinese people have been taught historical narrative that they own the South China Sea. And the Chinese government will not comply with the ruling because the Chinese people will say, why are you giving away territory that has been handed down to us by ancestors? These are sacred waters, sacred territory, sacred islands. So the Chinese government would not comply. Otherwise, the Chinese people might throw them out. So we had to ask the tribunal, kindly rule on whether that historical narrative of China is true or false, whether there is, there are factual, there is factual basis for that historical narrative. Thankfully, the tribunal obliged. So we raised this issue. As a matter of fact, did China have historic rights? We're talking of history now, not uh, legal basis. So we, how did we convince the tribunal that China never had historic rights? Well, we presented over 170 ancient maps, the most number of maps submitted in any international arbitration. And we presented maps of the Chinese dynasties which they cannot, which China cannot disown. We presented Philippine maps and maps of other Southeast Asian countries and we presented ma European maps of Asia made by European cartographers. And we presented official documents of China after the Qing dynasty. So let's go to the maps. For the Philippines, uh, I will present only one map, the most important map of the Philippines. This is the 1734 Murillo Velarde map. And uh, this map is the first map to give a name to Scarborough. And that name is Panakot. This is the first map that gave a name to Scarborough Shoal. And that name is a Tagalog word, Panakot. Why Panakot? Panakot means danger. If you are the captain of a ship and you don't know where Panakot is, 
your ship could hit the rocks of Panakot and your ship will run aground. And that is what happened to a British tea clipper ship called Scarborough. It ran aground on Panakot shore, on, Panakot, on the rocks of Panakot, and the European cartographers renamed the shoal Scarborough Shoal. But we were the first to give it a name. There is no older map from China or from Vietnam or from any other country showing that Scarborough Shoal belongs to them, or Scarborough Shoal is their territory. We have the oldest map. And this map also shows Los Bajos de Paragua. Paragua is the old Spanish name of Palawan. Uh, it was named Palawan only during the American regime. Los Bajos uh, is the Spanish term for shoals, the shoals of Paragua. The shoals of Paragua are the Spratlys. And there is no older map from China or from Vietnam showing that the Spratlys belong to them. We have the oldest map showing the Spratlys with a name. This is the first time that the Spratlys were given a name, Los Baos de Paragua. Now, this map was made by Father Pedro Miruel Velarde, a Jesuit priest. Uh, he was probably the most brilliant Spanish friar who was sent to the Philippines uh, during the Spanish regime. And the engraver of this map, because this is engraved in copper plates, the engraver of this map is a Filipino, Nic Nic Nicolas de la Cruz Bagay. And the one who, the artist who drew this map is another Filipino, Francisco Suarez. And why is this map important? It is important because of this cartouche. This cartouche is the royal coat of arms of the King of Spain which means this is an official map of the Spanish kingdom showing Philippine territory in 1734. That's the cartouche. In 1732, King Philip V of Spain instructed the Spanish governor general at the time, General Governor General Tamon, to make a map of Philippine territory. And Governor Tamon commissioned Father Pedro Miguel Velarde, the Jesuit priest. So this is an official map of the Philippine territory during the Spanish regime. And this makes it very important because this map determines Philippine territory even up to today. So remember that this map shows Scarborough Shoal with the name of Panacot and the Spratlys with the name of Los Baos de Paragua. We will go back to this map later. Ancient maps of China. Now, China published the Atlas of Ancient Maps in China, three volumes, different dates, one in uh, 1990, the other one 1994, the other one in 1997. And China cannot disown these maps because they have published this atlas, official publication of the People's Republic of China. So we go to this map. This is a map of over a thousand years ago during the Tang Dynasty. And it shows Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. This is map 97 of the Atlas of Ancient Maps of China. So during the Tang Dynasty, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. The next map is the map that was made during the Song Dynasty, 1136, and this shows Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. There is just one copy of this map, and that copy is still there in China because this is a stone map. In the 1900s, early 1900s, a Frenchman put a paper over the stone map and rubbed it, and this is the rubbing. This. Uh, it's now in the U.S. Library of Congress where I downloaded a copy, a high resolution, and that's it. And this map is map number 60 of the Atlas of Ancient Maps of China. So China cannot disown this. And you can even see this stone map today. It's still there in the Forest of Stone Steels Museum in Xi'an, China. There's only one copy of this map. It's still there. So you have the Song Dynasty. The next dynasty is the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Dynasty. And this is a Yuan Dynasty map. And it shows 
Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. This is map number 193 of the Atlas of Ancient Maps of China. So during the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Dynasty, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. So you have the Song, the you have Yuan, and the next dynasty is the Ming Dynasty. And this is a Ming Dynasty map. And it shows Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. And the Chinese are very, uh, this is one of their favorites, uh, favorite maps. And they put this as map number one of the Atlas of Ancient Maps of China. There's only one copy of this map because this map is painted on silk. And the original copy is still there in the first historical archive of China in Beijing. So during the Ming Dynasty, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. And we go to the last dynasty of China, the Qing Dynasty. This is a map of the Qing Dynasty. It shows Hainan, uh, the southernmost territory of China. This is map 129 of the Atlas of Ancient Maps of China. So during the Qing Dynasty, Hainan was the southernmost territory of China. So from the, from the Song to the Qing, almost a uh, thousand years, the southernmost territory of China was Hainan. The Qing Dynasty ended in 1912. So we presented this before the tribunal. We showed the map of Asia and we superimposed all the maps of the Chinese dynasties. And it shows Hainan was the southernmost territory of China during the dynasties. China never occupied the Paracels, never occupied the Spratlys, never occupied Scarborough Shoal. Now, that is our submission to China. We said in our submission pleading to China in the beef to the Hague Tribunal, Chinese territory extended no further south than Hainan. Now, when did China move out of Hainan? In 1932, the Paracels were not occupied by any country, and the French occupied the Paracels in 1932. The French were then the colonial power in uh, Vietnam. And China, under the Kuomintang, protested China sent a note verbal to the French government on September 29, 1932, protesting. That's the note verbal. And in that note verbal, China said there are two groups in uh, the Paracels, the Amphitrite groups and the Crescent group. They lie 145 nautical miles from Hainan Island and form the southernmost part of Chinese territory. The Paracels formed the southernmost part of Chinese territory, China in 1932, in an official declaration to the world, said our southernmost territory are the Paracels. They cannot back out from that. And so we presented it again to the tribunal. Chinese territory ended in the Paracels, never reached the Spratlys, never reached Scarborough Shoal. We are already in 1932. China became a republic after the end of the Qing Dynasty 1912. And as a republic, you must have a constitution. And China had several constitutions. Their first constitution, provincial constitution in 1914, defined their territory because you must define your territory in your constitution. The territory of the Republic of China continues to be the territory of the former empire. The People's Republic of China interpreted the former empire to refer to the Qing Dynasty territory. China did that um, uh, made that de uh, declaration in China Number no. 2 History Archive, China International Press, that's in the 1980s. Because at that time, China was trying to prove to the world that Tibet forms part of China. And uh, during the Qing Dynasty, Tibet was part of China. So China, according to the People's Republic of China that published this, the former empire refers to the Qing Dynasty. Because the Qing Dynasty was the largest expansion of Chinese territory in history. That was the largest expansion of Chinese territory. It included Tibet, it included Xinjiang, and it, but unfortunately for China, the southernmost territory of China during the Qing Dynasty was Hainan. So that is the constitution of China. Their territory is the territory of the Qing. The territory of the Qing never went further south than Hainan. The next 
uh, Constitution of China, the Constitution of 1924, the same. The territory of China, of the Republic of China, continues to be the, ter the traditional territory, which means the territory of the Qing. That territory ended in Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. 1937 uh, Constitution of China, still the same. Territory of the Republic of China continues to be the territory it owned in the past. And their largest expansion was during the Qing Dynasty. January 1, 1947, the last Constitution of China, still the same. The, the territory of the Republic of China uh, are those encompassed by its traditional boundaries. So, in their own constitutions, China said our territory referred to the territory of the Qings, the Qing Dynasty, but that territory ended in Hainan. China suffered what they called the century of national humiliation because starting in the 1820s toward until the end of the uh, 1800s, foreign powers from Europe and even Japan and Russia occupied territories of China. You have the British, you have the Portuguese. Uh, so the Chinese suffered a lot of humiliation because they were defeated in several wars with the European powers. So their people drew maps. They called these maps map of China's national humiliation. Their people said, when China becomes strong again, we will recover all the territories that we lost to the foreign powers. And they drew lines around China, said we will recover everything within the lines. And they included other territories that they never owned in the past. So here you will see they will get even Borneo, part of Borneo. They will get Cambodia, Vietnam. So they, they, these were drawn by private citizens it was circulated widely within China. That's the map of national humiliation of 1927. But you will see in this map, China never included the Spratlys or Scarborough. So in their wildest dreams of recovering perceived properties that they lost, they never thought that they lost the Spratlys or Scarborough because they never thought they owned the Spratlys or Scarborough. But you will see here they included the Sulu Archipelago as part of the territory to be recovered. Why? Because in 1417, the Sultan of Sulu, uh, Sultan uh, Paduka Batara, left Sulu on a grand voyage to China. He brought with him, with him his wife, his children, his large entourage, and they sailed to China and brought gifts to the emperor. It was like a grand uh, tour, and probably he brought South Sea pearls. And the Chinese saw it, and they said, oh, that sultan is now a vassal of the emperor because he was given a tribute. He was giving a tribute to the emperor. And so they included the Sulu archipelago as part of the territory of China to be recovered because Sultan Paduka went there giving a gift, but they interpreted it, the Chinese interpreted it as a tribute that he became a vassal. So it's very dangerous to bring a gift to China, to the Chinese uh, emperor or the Chinese leader, because they will consider that as a tribute and you become a vassal. So when you give something, you have to qualify and clarify that it's just a gift, it's not a tribute. Here is another map of national humiliation, the 1938 map. Thankfully, they excluded the Sulu archipelago, but still, they never included the Spratlys or Scarborough Shoal. In their wildest dreams, they never thought that Spratlys or Scarborough Shoal belonged to them. So they never included the Spratlys or Scarborough Shoal in their maps of national humil humiliation. This map was taught to elementary school children, and that's why the Chinese really believe that they own the South China Sea because this includes the South China Sea. Now, in 1943, while the civil war in uh, uh, the mainland, mainland China was going on between the communists and the nationalists, the Kuomintang, the Kuomintang was in control of the government and the Ministry of Information of the Republic of China at the time, in 1943, published a handbook because the Kuomintang, the 
was trying to introduce the Republic of China to the world, so they published a handbook, China Handbook. And of course, if you introduce yourself to the world, you have to state your territory. What is your territory? And in chapter one of the handbook, China said, our territory extended to the parcel group. Triton Island is the southernmost territory. So in their 1943 handbook, China never claimed the Spratlys or Scarborough Shoal. They said our southernmost territory are the parcels. Their own document, official document. This handbook was revised. That's the copy of the handbook. I was able to buy it at, uh, in eBay. Difficult to look for this book now. And this was revised uh, in 1946. They published a revised uh, edition of the book. And it is in this handbook, the 1946 handbook, which was actually published in 1947, but uh, it contains a supplement of 1946. It is in this handbook that China claims sovereignty over the Spratlys. They call it the Coral Islands. But at the same time, China admitted that the Coral Islands are contested among China, the Commonwealth of the Philippines, and the French in Indochina. So China did not claim indisputable sovereignty over the Spratlys. This is 1946. China said, yes, we're claiming the Spratlys, but it's also claimed by the Philippines, by the French in Vietnam. So they never claimed indisputable sovereignty. That's the handbook, 1940. It was released in 1947, but there is a 1946 supplement, so you either call it 1946 or 1947. Published in New York because of the ongoing civil war, they did not have a good printing press in China. Now, in 1947, China made this map. This is the infamous nine dash line map and China circulated this internally among the Chinese government offices for validation. And in February of 1948, China released this domestically in China. And in this map, the nine dash line map, China now gave a name to all the features in the Spratlys. But they just copied the names in British charts. They were they did not give original names, and they included Scarborough, but they did not have a name for Scarborough Shoal. We are now in 1947, and China still didn't have a name for Scarborough Shoal. So China, prob China used this uh, China Sea Directory, published 1906 by the UK, and gave the same names. Lukunya Shoal, that's the British name, transliterated to Chinese, Lukangya. James Shoal, translate, transliterated, Jiang Mu. So China just copied the British names. They were not the first to give names to the Spratlys. And in, of course, in Scarborough Shoal, we gave it a name in 1734, Panakot. The Europeans renamed it Scarborough Shoal after the Scarborough ship ran aground in 1748. 1947, China still had no name to Scarborough Shoal. Now, if you go to the Spratlys, and the parcels, you will see these sovereignty stone markers. These are stone markers which says China was here in 1901, China was here in 1902, and the Chinese point to these markers as evidence that they own these islands. So they called it their sovereignty markers in the parcels and the spratlys. These markers are totally fake, and I will prove it. In 1987, the province of Guangdong published a book, compilation of the names of all the islands in Nanhai, South Sea, explaining why they named these islands the way they named them. And this book has a very interesting, a very interesting annex and editor's note, part of the book. As a background, in 1937, June, China announced that they, China was sending this guy, Wang Chang, to the Paracels to check if the Japanese have established bases in the Paracels and to assert Chinese sovereignty over the Paracels. That was the announcement. But actually, Chan Chang had a secret mission. And he made a report of his secret mission, a confidential report of July 1, because 
he went there June, so he wrote this report, July, the following month. And in his report, he said, I placed these stone markers in North Island. It says they're commemorating the inspection of 1902. In, in uh, the other part of North Island, commemorating the inspection of 1902. In uh, Woody Island, commemorating the inspection of 1911. So he was planting these stone markers, antedated stone markers, in 1937. And he placed these markers in about 20, 24 places in the Paracels. He was there in 1937. He was planting markers commemorating the inspection of 1901. So these are antedated. Now, when China published the book, when the Guangdong province published this book, a lowly clerk saw this confidential report and decided to include it as an annex to the book. So the confidential report became part of the book by mistake. And uh, I was alerted by a friend of mine, uh, Francois Javier Bonnet, who has written extensively on the South China Sea. He's a French scholar. He said, I saw this book in a library in uh, Hong Kong. And look at, he got the Xerox copies of several pages. He said, look at this, all of these stone markers in the Spratleys and in the Paracels are fake. So I said, I must have a copy of this book. And so I asked a friend of mine who frequented, frequented Manila and Beijing on business to look for a copy of this book in second-hand bookstores in Beijing. And he was able to secure, to buy one copy. He scoured all the bookstores in Beijing and found one copy. And I have that copy. And this is uh, a, f a picture, a photo of the of the of that book and uh, I guess uh, I suppose that after we published this uh, the Chinese government I understand recalled all copies of the book so this is a very rare book now so the stone markers in the parcels are fake and they cannot the Chinese cannot deny this because it's there in their own publication how about the stone markers in the Spratlys on page 291 of the same book, there is an editor's note that the stone tablets on two islands, West York Island and Spratly Island in the Spratlys, might have been erected by the Taiwanese Navy in 1956, not in 1946, as the stone tablets indicate. So the stone tablets in Works Island says erected in December 1946. The stone tablet in the Spratly says erected in December 1946. Were they really erected in 1946? In 1946, after the Japanese forces left uh, Ituaba, the Kumintang government sent a ship to the, uh, the, the Spratlys, the Taiping. It was a, a U.S. ship actually donated to the Kumintang and they renamed it Taiping. And the captain of the ship went only to Ituaba and he planted the marker there. But he never went to West York Island in 1946. He never went to the Spratly Island. So when he saw the book saying that there are stone markers there in, the, uh, in Spratly Island and in West York Island planted in December 1946, he went to the editors of the book. The editors of the book are professors in Guangdong universities. And he said, I was the captain of the ship that went to Ituaba in 1946, in December. We never put up any stone tablets in West York Island or in Spratly Island. We put up one only in, the, in Ituaba. So the editors said, they placed a note, those stone tablets might have been erected by the Taiwanese Navy in 1956, not in 1940. Why 1956? Because, as I said, after the defeat of the Japanese forces in uh, 1945, uh, the Kumintang took possession of Ituaba in 1946, but they left Ituaba in uh, 1949, 1950, because the Chiang Kai-shek forces, the nationalists, fled the mainland to Taiwan. And Chiang Kai-shek recalled all the troops in Ituaba to help defend Taiwan against uh, uh, what they expected was a communist Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So they left. And they returned only in 1956 as a Taiwanese Navy now. That's why the editors put that editor's note. And 
when they returned, they probably erected those stone markers in West York Island and Spratly Island and put there the date December 1946, antedated. So it's very clear those stone markers are totally fake. Now, before the, just before the, we filed a, uh, our case with the, against China uh, with the Ancos Tribunal at The Hague, I visited the Chinese Manila website, the Chinese embassy website in Manila, and I saw this. In that website, this is a screenshot, China said, we were the first to discover Wang Yan, that's Scarborough Shoal for them, in, in 1279. Because in 1279, Gu Jing put up an observatory in Wang Yan Island upon instruction of Kublai Khan. Now, Gu Su Jing was the Leonardo da Vinci of China at the time. He was a brilliant mathematician, engineer. He was an astronomer. Uh, and he built canals for China. And uh, Kublai Khan instructed him, make an accurate calendar. Because we want to know the, when the four seasons will end and start. When will summer Come, when will it end? When will uh, autumn come? When will it end? When will winter come and end? When will uh, spring come and end? Because we want to know when to plant, when to harvest, when to irrigate. So, Gu Su Jing put up observatories, astronomical observatories, 26 on mainland China and one in Nanhai, one in the South Sea. Where in the South Sea did he put up his observatory? This screenshot says, the Chinese embassy in Manila says, he put it up in Scarborough Shoal, Hawangian Island. However, in 1980, when uh, Vietnam and uh, China was quarreling over sovereignty of the Paracels, the Vietnamese have very strong records, story records that they own the Paracels. China pulled out a rabbit out of its hat and said, we have an older title to the Paracels because in 1279, Kublai Khan ordered Gu Su Jing to put up an observatory in the Paracels. Remember, Kublai Khan put up 27 observatories, 26 on mainland China, and one in the South China Sea, South Sea. Where? In 1980, the Chinese were saying that was in Sija, what is internationally called the Paracels. And they published this in Beijing Review. In Beijing Review, official publication of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China, the astronomical observation point Nanhai was in today's Xizhia Islands. The shows that Xizhia Islands were within the bounds of China at the time of the Yuan Dynasty. So they said Gu Su Jing put up the observatory in the Paracels. Today, the Chinese are saying Gu Su Jing put it up in Scarborough Shoal. That's the Beijing Review where they published their article. The Paracels are here, 380 nautical miles away from Scarborough Shoal. It's very far. The brilliant guy Gu Su Jing could not have made a mistake. If he put it up there in Paracels, he could not have put it up in Scarborough Shoal. Now, of the 26 observatories that Gu Su Jing put up in mainland China, one still exists today in Henan province. And this is it. Huge, 12.6 meter high. There's a sundial here, massive bricks. Could he have put it, this observatory on the rocks of Scarborough Shoal? Now, the rocks of Scarborough Shoal are very small, maybe uh, three meters high at uh, above water at high tide. Maybe at most 10 people can stand on it. Could he have put it here? If you superimpose the astronomical observation point in Henan, it would look like that. He could not have placed it there. Impossible. So legally, China cannot now say that Gu Su Jing put, it up, put up the observatory in Scarborough Shoal because they used that argument against the Vietnamese in 1980. Physically, it's also impossible. They could not have put it up there. So the tribunal said China never had historic rights in the South China Sea. They cannot identify the tribunal is 
unable to identify any evidence that would suggest that China historically regulated or controlled shipping, fishing rather, in the South China Sea. Scarborough Shoal, that's Scarborough Shoal, that's a satellite imagery. Huge 150 square kilometers in area. This is the entry exit point. All the around here are the coral reefs. Now, who owns Scarborough Shoal? We all know that in the Treaty of Paris of 1898, Spain ceded the Philippines to the US for $20 million. The Treaty of Paris contained these lines, the treaty lines of the Treaty of Paris, and Spain ceded to the US everything within the lines for $20 million. Unfortunately, Scarborough Shoal is outside the line. The Spratlys are outside the lines. Big problem for us. So Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, in his lecture at CSIS in Washington in February of 2016, before diplomats from all over the world said, the Philippine territory is regulated by three treaties, the Treaty of Paris of 1898, the Treaty of Washington of 1900, and the Treaty of 1930 with the British. And there is a line in those treaties. Everything to the east was ceded, but to the west, they were not ceded. And Wang Yi said, Nansha, the Spratlys, and Wang Yan, Scarborough Shell, are all in the west of 118 degrees. They are outside the treaty lines. So the Philippines does not own these islands. So how do we answer that? We answer that by going to the second treaty of Washington of 1900. When the Americans, after signing the Treaty of Paris, the Americans came here and they found out there were many islands outside the treaty lines. In the Batanes, you have Scarborough Shoal, in the Sulu Archipelago, Mapan Island, Turtle Island, they were all outside the treaty lines. So they went back to the Spaniards. They said, hey, let's clarify. There are still many islands outside the treaty lines. Can we clarify that these islands were also ceded to us? And the Spaniards said, no, we will not sign. And the Americans said, we will pay you an additional $100,000. And the Spaniards said, yes, we will sign. So the Treaty of Washington was signed. And Spain clarified that it had all sole relinquished to the U.S., all title and claim of title which Spain may have had at the time of the conclusion of the Treaty of Peace of Paris, to any and all islands belonging to the Philippine archipelago lying outside the lines. Any and all islands belonging to the Philippine archipelago lying outside the lines are also ceded to the U.S. for an additional $100,000. So the Treaty of Washington is actually the more important treaty because it includes all islands belonging to the Philippine archipelago within or outside the treaty lines. But the Treaty of Washington is never taught to us. That's why we have uh, some uh, professors, even law professors, who have been saying, let's not uh, talk about Scarborough Shoal and the Spratlys because they are outside the treaty lines. They have forgotten about the Treaty of Washington. So the question is, what are the islands belonging to the Philippine archipelago lying outside the lines? What is our frame of reference in locating these islands? It says any and all islands lying outside of the treaty lines belonging to the Philippine archipelago. What is our frame of reference? the 1734 Pedro Murillo Velarde map. Because this is the official Philippine territory under the Spanish regime, and this is what they have ceded to the Americans under the Treaty of Washington and the Treaty of Paris. And that includes, of course, Scarborough Shoal and the Spratly. So this map is still alive today. This map determines our territory territory that was ceded by Spain to the U.S. and which is now our territory as uh, the Republic of the Philippines. So we have to go back to this map. That's why when this map was auctioned off, because there's no copy of this map in our public libraries, and when a copy of this map was being auctioned in Sotheby's, uh, I asked the 
public libraries, the national museums, uh, the private museums, if they can bid for it and uh, they were not interested and uh, the public government owned museums didn't have the budget for it, so I asked a friend to bid for it and if he wins, to sell it at cost to the government because I want a copy of this map in the National Library so that school children, when they see this map, you don't have to explain to them. Scarborough Shore is part of Philippine territory since 1734. The Spratlys are part of Philippine territory since 1734. So he bidded for the map and fortunately he won. And he has donated it because uh, the government offices, uh, the National Library, National Museum don't have this in their budget. He just, my friend just decided to donate it to the National Library. So it's been donated to the National Library. Now, before the ruling came out, China claimed this shaded area. When the tribunal said the nine dash lines have no legal effect, so immediately you have high seas in the South China Sea, about 20-25% of the South China Sea are high seas, and all around that you, you have the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. This could belong only to the Philippines because it's only the Philippines that is the adjacent coastal state. And this is the uh, EEZ of uh, Malaysia in Sabah, EEZ of Brunei, EEZ of uh, Malaysia again in the other part of Sabah, the EEZ of Indonesia in the Natunas, the EEZ of Vietnam, and the EEZ of China. So automatically you have high seas and exclusive economic zones around those high seas. This area, the shaded area in red, is what we want. How big is that? That's as big as the, uh, larger than the Philippine national territory, uh, the land territory. These three dots are still disputed because they are uh, rocks above water at high tide between the Philippines and China. That's still in dispute because the tribunal has no jurisdiction over uh, territorial issues. It has only jurisdiction over maritime issues. So we want an area of 376,000 square kilometers in the South China Sea, free from any Chinese claim. This is larger than our total land area. If you put all our islands together, you get only 300,000 square kilometers. So we want an area, maritime space, larger than our total land area. And we own everything within this huge maritime area, all the fish, oil, gas, and other mineral resources. Now, there are maritime zones under UNCLOS. Assuming this is Palawan, you have a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles from the low water mark. From the edge of the territorial sea, you measure 188 nautical miles. You have the EEZ, exclusive economic zone. And from here, you have the high seas. This is our extended continental shelf. Uh, this is the area belonging to mankind. But the point here is that from the edge of the territorial sea seaward, there is freedom of navigation and overflight. Civilian aircraft, military aircraft, civilian vessel, military vessel can sail and fly in this area without getting the consent of the coastal state because there's freedom of navigation for all countries of the world. So when the ruling came out, the U.S. said, we will sail and fly in the South China Sea. France said, we will also sail and fly. We will ask our European neighbors to join us in a regular patrol in the South China Sea. The British said we will do the same. When our two aircraft carriers are finished, we will sail them in the South China Sea. Australia said we will continue to sail and fly in the South China Sea. Now, the tribunal made a specific finding on mischief reef. The tribunal f said we find mischief reef is a low tide elevation. It's submerged at high tide, so it's low tide. You can see it only at low tide, and therefore, Mischief Reef has no territorial sea and cannot be owned because it's beyond the territorial sea of any state. And it forms part of the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. So there is a clear categorical ruling by the tribunal that Mischief Reef uh, has no territorial sea, no territorial airspace. It's part of the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. And as part of the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, 
it can only be exploited by the Philippines. Only the Philippines can put up structures there. If China is still there now, China is there as a squatter. Now, that's mischief reef. Huge. It's totally submerged at high tide in its natural state before the reclamation by China. Today, three kilometer military grade runway, barracks for thousands of Marines. Uh, you have radars, structures there, entry and exit for warships and submarines. That's the runway in Mischief Reef. Any jet fighter here can reach Manila in less than 20 minutes, can reach Puerto Princesa in less than 10 minutes. The radar here can monitor any aircraft that lands or takes off in Puerto Princesa or in the entire Palawan area. So this one, this uh, air base uh, and naval base is both an air and naval base. The Chinese call this their Pearl Harbor in the South China Sea. This is a dagger pointed at us because this uh, mischief reef air and naval base of China will be used by China to enforce the Nine Dash Line as China's national boundary. So when the ruling came out, the Americans decided to test. Because the ruling said, mischief reef has no territorial sea, the U.S. sailed this ship zigzag. Because if this were a territorial sea, this ship should sail straight line continuous, without stopping. But to show to the Chinese here in Mischief Reef that this is not a territorial sea because it's an artificial island, they zigzag, they conducted man overboard operations, they sent aloft their drones to prove. So they, are, they were actually enforcing the ruling for us. And the, this uh, ship, uh, the USS Giffords, Sailed there again, in, sailed there in November 16, recently, 2019, the same way to show to the Chinese that this is not a territorial sea. They were enforcing the ruling. And this plane, the U.S. Poseidon, which can detect submarines that are submerged and can drop torpedoes from the air, flew over Mischief Reef. And this was the conversation between the Chinese ground controller and the, and the U.S. aircraft. The ground controller, the Chinese ground controller said, leave immediately to avoid any misunderstanding. The U.S. aircraft said, we are conducting lawful military activities beyond the national airspace of any coastal state. This is not a territorial airspace. We can fly here because there's freedom of overflight. This is part of the EEZA of the Philippines. So the Americans were enforcing the ruling for us, not because they love us, but because it's in their national interest to protect their sea lanes. Remember, of the 5.2 trillion US, uh, trade of shipboard goods that traverse the South China Sea every year, over a trillion of that is U.S. inbound and outbound trade. They have to maintain freedom of navigation and overflight. The French, they have two naval ships that continuously sail in the South China Sea because they want to maintain a naval presence in all exclusive economic zones because in the exclusive economic zones, there's freedom of navigation. The British, they have two naval ships also sailing continuously in the South China Sea because they want an unbroken presence in the South China Sea because they want the rules to preserve the integrity of the rules-based international system. That's the code word for the ruling. They want to enforce the ruling without saying that we're enforcing the ruling. They're, it's a euphemism for them. Integrity of the rules-based international system. The Japanese have two helicop helicopter carriers. Every year they alternate in sailing in the South China Sea. This dock in Subic, uh, the last time it was here, I visited it and I asked the captain of the ship, where in the South China Sea did you sail? And he answered, in the West Philippine Sea. That's our easy. What did you do in the Philippine Easy? He said, we sent aloft this helicopter. That's a military activity. They were telling China, this is an exclusive economic zone of a coastal state and we have freedom of navigation here. The Indonesians, uh, the, rather the Indians, they have every year they send a naval task force in the South China Sea to assert freedom of navigation. The Canadians do the same every year. 
to preserve, to assert freedom of navigation. So the, all these naval powers actually enforce the ruling for us because they are showing to the Chinese that these are exclusive economic zones or high seas. Remember, China refuses to accept that there are exclusive economic zones in the South China Sea within the Nine Dash Line. These naval patrols of the naval powers rebut that forcefully. All this freedom of navigation and overflight operations are directed at China. This is not your waters. These are high seas or exclusive economic zones of other coastal states. And therefore, we can sail here. So what should we as Filipinos do now? We should encourage all the navies of the world to sail in the South China Sea and in particular in the West Philippine Sea so that they will enforce the ruling. Also, we should ask our neighbors, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei, to help us explain to the Chinese people that China never had historic rights in the South China Sea. It's totally false. And all of us in ASEAN should educate the world that China never had historic rights in the South China Sea. All these claims of China under the Nine Dash Line is totally false. We should continue resorting to the rule of law because we have no other choice. Why don't we have a choice? Well, our constitution says we renounce war as an instrument of national policy and we cannot enforce the ruling by going to war. We have to use the rule of law. And also the UN Charter prohibits war as a means or use of force or threat of force as a means of settling territorial or maritime disputes. War or use of force or threat of force has been outlawed under the UN Charter. And under our own constitution, what is the power of the president? Can the president declare war? No, he cannot even declare war. The power of the president is limited to calling the armed forces in case of invasion, but he cannot direct an aggression against another state. It's not one of his powers. Only if there is an invasion can he call out the armed forces. The power to declare war is lodged in Congress. Congress, by two-thirds vote of both houses in joint session assembled, voting separately, shall have the sole power to declare the existence of a state of war. That's our constitution. So we must fight this battle with China. We must preserve our sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea through the rule of law. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you for your patience and kind attention.